Hey guys, welcome back to the No Holds Barred Network with another episode of Under the Ropes. I'm your host as always, the queen of the indies, Tiffany. And today I'm joined with special guest, Neil Diamond Cutter. How are you? Hey, what's crack a lacking out there, y'all? <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, well, I know uh, Staple Gun Bob couldn't join us today, <laughs> even though yeah. I guess he had to go for a little walk to make sure the signal was good. So yeah, I, I left Bob behind. <laughs> He's taking a nap right now, so <laughs> we'll just... yeah. he needs a makeover anyway. He needs a makeover. Oh my God, are you gonna like bedazzle him or something? Like. Sorry, been bedazzled. I mean, like, I, I need to touch him up, make sure he's up to par. That way he's not slacking it, you know? Larry Legend's <laughs> giving him a good run for his money as far as being the well-dressed at any show. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So cool. Well, guys, if you're new to the Under the Rope series on the No Holds Barred Network, here we interview everything independent wrestling, whether it's promoters, referees, wrestlers, anything behind the scenes, I got you covered. If you guys got any questions for Neil, please drop them in the chat. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. So are you ready for this, Neil? We're going to break down the... (laughs) <laughs> like in the ring, I'm always ready. Oh, he's ready. He's ready. He's ready. Okay, so I always like to start off my interviews with uh, the people that might not know a lot about you, but I would love to start off to know how you got into professional wrestling. Uh, I actually watched a show on, uh, I think, a random Saturday or Monday. I'm not real sure. My uh, brain tends to mix and match up, but I remember seeing Glacier come out for the first time and like, oh, that dude looks like Sub-Zero. That's pretty cool. And then I think he faced uh, DDP, I want to say. But it, it could be a different opponent. But Glacier was definitely the first dude I ever saw. Oh, wow. And I just kept watching the show and saw Jericho and Rey Mysterio go at it and like saw the Cruiserweights and what they could do. And I was like, oh, I could do that. And just fell in love with the storytelling of it all. And just one thing led to another. Chris Jericho was really my my inspiration to get into wrestling and uh, just got onto the indies and started doing my thing and um, just really snowballed from there. And about seven, eight years in, I got on the IWA Mid-South and started doing death matches. And uh, now I'm doing what I'm doing now and trying to cause as many car wrecks in a year as possible and going for a Guinness World Record. (laughs) I love it. Do you prefer... Regular wrestling up against deathmatch, or would you prefer the deathmatch scene over like regular wrestling? Uh, I actually prefer doing deathmatches, mm-hmm. only because like I I feel I can really be creative in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we all say that it's an art form, and I thought of a cool uh, analogy for it, and that my blood is my paint, my body is my brush, and my canvas is my mat. You know, and that's what our art form is. It's just a real creative way to. I guess, show what the body can endure. And to me, it's about uh, showing that you can do these real cool creative things and not just go out there and just hit each other and punch and that be that. You know, it's not the purest form, but it's definitely the mo- one of the more creative forms of wrestling. Definitely is. Definitely. I feel like it's like everybody, depending on like your cup of tea of wrestling, because you ha- have those fans that – um, either it freaks them out, the deathmatch scene, maybe it's a little too bloody. Sometimes some of the things that we see in deathmatch can be a little much, but the fan base, I feel like the fan base is a little bit more loyal for some reason than the regular, like regular oh, wrestling. Oh yeah. They're super diehard. Cause they, to one degree or another, like they understand that the human body isn't supposed to go through this right. as often as it does. And they, like just to a degree they understand that our bodies are being wrecked with their entertainment you know it's cool looking and uh it's real dangerous looking but we can seriously get messed up really bad yeah in those matches you know some nick gate died during a death match like yeah you know what you come back from that marcus crane could have died i could have died from multiple death matches like that's just the element of danger in them right and that's the reason why we do them and the fans just totally get it they, they're the most appreciative people I've ever met. And at normal shows, when they see me do normal matches, they're like, oh, that's cool. But they're not, <laughs> oh, thank you. We really appreciate what you do. You know, I always hear that all the time now. And like, it's just awesome for me because it just shows that they actually care. Yeah. You know, 
I, I appreciate you guys, like, you know, putting your bodies and, you know, through all this. And I've had multiple deathmatch wrestlers on the No Holds Bar Network. I mean, Orin Veidt was talking about the first shower after a deathmatch. That is very painful. <laughs> Like, yeah, you get used to it. You get used to it? Like, after every time he thinks, like, no, it's still it's still a lot. I remember him saying on, on his... I don't know. It, I, I like to think that I'm kind of like doomsday in a sense. Like, uh -huh. I can't be killed. But when you get real close, like, I just become adapted to that pain. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I also haven't had, like, real huge gouges in a long time. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that suck. But <laughs> I don't usually get big gouges anymore. Like, just, I've been very lucky with it lately. Right. So, but I, I've learned that rain setting is the best because it's gentle. It just pours out and uh, just don't make the water too hot or too cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's finding the right medium pretty much for it. So, Mew likes everything. I appreciate both. I love the deathmatch scene and I love like that I can see deathmatch wrestlers get into a regular match as well. So, definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Like, I'm down for any style that anyone wants to throw me in. Just no one books me for anything but death matches. Yeah. Like, yeah, I prefer them, but if somebody wants to book me for a normal match, I'll come out and throw a fist to cuts with someone. Like, it don't bother me. It's just I prefer to do death matches. But right. if you want me for a normal match, I'll do it. Right. Done scramble, fans. Like, I've done every match you can think of. So, if I got to do it to show someone that I can do more than just death matches, so be it. Right. What I get. Okay. Uh, so I had a fan tweet from Metal. I stuck it here. Uh, usually I do my fan tweets later on into the interview, but this one I figure was very important into the beginning. So it's from our friend Metal. He goes, where did the nickname the Honey Badger come from? And did he come up with it or was it given to him? Uh, actually, uh, when I was living in Phoenix, Arizona, I returned to, de or returned to wrestling in general in like 2015 for Party Hard. And uh, over the course of me being there, I met you know, friends and stuff like that, or wrestling band also. And uh, just by happenstance, I met these people. And um, one day, my buddy Jason walks over, and he's like, you know what you need to be? You need to be the honey badger. And I'm like, why is that? I'm like, because they don't give a shit. <laughs> he me a video about it. I'm like, oh, my God, this is really me. Because my mentality towards Party Hard was these guys thought they were up-and-comers in the area, and they thought they were doing edgy shit. And I'm sitting there like, no, you want to do edgy, like, we get violent. Like, I'll take tacks and barbed wire and light tubes. Like, I'll do whatever the fuck you want. And they're like, we'll never ask you to bleed. I'm like, you'll never have to. Just ask me to do a death match. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, pay me for the death match. Like, I'll do it. I'll do it willingly. And I'll become the most famous person you have on your roster. Yeah. Like, I already knew that I had the tools to become their biggest face. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a lot of the guys down there that are kind of local yokels, they don't go very far. Uh, a lot of them were like, oh, for a 15-year vet, you suck. And I'm going to do a match you can name. And so I told the owner, like, I don't ever care about winning and put me in whatever match you want. I don't care. Multi-man scrambles, like, the fatal four-ways, tag matches. I don't care. I can do it all. And just to prove a point to all these people, I don't need to win a single match. And I don't think I did except for, like, two matches, I think, oh, wow. in like, three years there. And, like, I was still one of the biggest faces they had. Okay. So... Like, it was just a guy who traveled the country doing this and just got back into wrestling. They treated me as if I was a new guy, some yarder guy. And I'm like, nah, I've been on TV before. I've done the indies all across the country, and I've done some of the most extreme things you could think of. And you don't do your history. You don't study your indies, so you have no idea who the fuck I am. Right. So I had to prove it every time I went out there. Like, nah, I'd, I'll show you that I can be the biggest dude in the world right now. And up until the point I left, yeah, I was. But the Honey Badger thing, uh, that was just a random friend just brought it up to me. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, oddly fitting. <laughs> and it was for, uh, I believe that was in 2018 is when I started doing that. So I can claim it before Pac tried to do it. Like, I saw a CM Punk Honey Badger shirt. And I'm like, nah, that's nah, that's my thing, man. Uh <laughs> Who, who else? There is an oh the uh, the Kansas City dude. I don't Matthew something. He's a he's a defensive dude for the Kansas City Chiefs. They call him the Honey Badger, and I'm like nah, I'm the Honey Badger dude. Like I set the precedent. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, let me read some of this stuff in the chat. So, uh, Sean Patrick O'Brien, shout out to you. He goes, yo, love you, Neil. Uh, <laughs> and then David Russell says, ask him about the Primo, the Primo drive from Primo in Colorado. Uh, okay. I think, I think I know what story he's talking about. So we had this dude named Kyle with us and I don't want to say his nickname because it's just, it's appropriate for popular people, I guess Okay. for the pop culture. Um, but, uh, like we help him get on a show and it's in uh, a fatal four way with like me and her dog and uh, a local guy. And this dude's never done it. He's a super green kid. He's like, oh, I want to do this, this, and this. And I just look at him, I'm like, no. No. I'm not, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing any of that shit. Like, no, you're a green boy. You get beat up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my whole mentality because I didn't want to deal with him. Every time we stopped, he'd hop out of the, out of the back hatch like he was a fucking gazelle and oh, start no. pouncing. Him. Like, he would start climbing up fucking buildings like the, at the rest stop. And I'm like, what are you doing, you little ape? <laughs> like, I don't under, like, oh, uh, no. I, yeah. Oh, like it was like a nine year old trapped in a twenty one year old body. So weird. <laughs> uh, like at the end of the show, uh one of the boys is like messing with him, like trying to egg him on to make him think that we're only using him as a green boy, which is not true. That's not how me and the hooligans function. You know, you ride with us, you're one of us. Yeah. And uh so this dude starts like outlandishly yelling at us, saying that we're using him and shit. Oh, and we wow. all staring at him like, What the fuck are you talking like, are you fucking kidding us? Like, we tried getting you on all the shows that we were on, and you only took one of them because you were in an actual match. Mm -hmm. Like, you didn't take any of the opportunities we gave you. Like, any anything you didn't do is on you. And, like, <laughs> at one point, he's like, oh, whatever, you guys are just trying to fuck me. And eventually, <laughs> he turns around, he's like, you don't get to fucking talk for the rest of the time. And, like, he slept basically the entire way back home. Didn't say a word. Didn't get out when we stopped for gas. Like, just stayed in that hatch and didn't do a fucking thing the rest of the way home. Oh, wow. And I haven't seen it since. Damn. Wow. Okay. Well. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming that's the story because that's the only funny <laughs> one I got back from Primo. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Bam Sullivan, shout out to you. He's in the chat. He goes, did I miss the strip tease? <laughs> oh, baby, it's still going. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm dancing right now. <laughs> Take off my shirt. Yeah. And Sean replied to him. He goes, I hope not. That's why I'm here. <laughs> good, good. I Spread can't. the word. Strip peas. Oh, man. Neil <laughs> Jake Galladay says, Neil, when you're coming back to my neck of the woods, haven't seen you since the last extravaganza. That makes me sad. Love you, buddy. Uh, I don't know, Jake. Uh, I'm saying it could be any time. For all I know, like, I haven't gotten the call yet, so we'll see, man. Fucking hopefully soon. I, I really want to come back and see everybody out there. It's always a blast on the East Coast. Yeah. Oh, you guys are awesome. Awesome. Um, so I like to recommend, I always like recommendations from the wrestler that comes on to the fan base that are watching these interviews and might not know you, but what is the go-to match that if they never seen you wrestle before that they should turn on right now and watch? Me versus Dale Patrick's yeah. from, uh, NHB 16 or no, Unlucky 13. That's, that's what it is. That's a good match. At the, uh, at the carnival room in jersey that match is fucking awesome. awesome like definitely a breakout performance for dale to kind of get his name like solidified on the map as, as the top dude and so a lot of solidified me is just a good worker in general like just showed uh that you know i'm here to stay and it's not no bullshit like i'm not just a fluke kind of dude every match you see with me is gonna be brutal so yeah, that that's the match you want to see. Someone told me that it was career defining type of match for me because it just encapsulates everything that's about me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the same thing about Dale too. Like it really defines him as a character right now. So uh, that's that's the match is me versus Dale Patrick's number two at uh, at HB thirteen. Yeah, definitely, definitely, really, really good, great match. Um, so I know when I messaged you and asked you to come onto the podcast, I told you the 
one thing that I definitely wanted to talk about with you was I wanted to talk about your entrance and I wanted to know why Sweet Carolina and how does it feel like when you come out and the whole crowd is singing? Well, uh, believe it or not, like that whole, the whole Neil Diamond, uh, Sweet Caroline is Ian's idea. Uh, I was, I was given that song. I did not want it. Oh. <laughs> you know, I always wanted to be Billy Badass, you know, being five foot two, you know, a hundred and nothing pounds. And, uh, Ian's like, no, 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 you're, you're good at making fun of yourself. So do this, like it'll, it'll get over, trust me. And just over time, I realized that is a much bigger song than, than what I realized at the time. You know, when people send me videos of like a stadium of 50,000 people in Japan singing Sweet Caroline, you know, you kind of realize that it's kind of popular. Right. So when I started coming out and people did the bum, 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 so good, so good, and it just got louder and louder as time went on, just I've learned to really appreciate it. Yeah. Like the, the minute and a half it takes to get to that point is worth it because once you get there, the whole crowd is into it. They're ready to to see something goofy and then they see a car wreck right in front of their eyes develop very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's cool. Like, especially like being live at the shows and being part of it. And it's just, just the aura that you feel around. A little flair to it. And when you're in a little building like H2O, it just makes it that much more intimate because you can literally feel the energy coming off of people. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, funny story about it though is uh, Supreme and uh, uh, Messiah were making fun of me at Crimson Crown Two, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming out, they're like, "Man, he's mellowing everyone out." I wonder what the fuck this is. Like, <laughs> he's the only weird one, you know. Like, he, he based his old gimmick off of a song, which is not not really true. Right. But uh, <laughs> you know, I like, completely threw him through a loop because they're like, "What's this guy? He's not serious. Like, what the fuck is he doing here?" And then by the end of the match, Messiah and Supreme are both like, that dude's a fucking workhorse. Neil Cutter was awesome in this match. I was like, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what doing. Converting people instantly in a heartbeat because they don't know what to expect once they hear that song play. Right. So right. Add an extra layer of like suspense and I guess uh, drama to it, I guess, to a, degree, a funny sense of drama. Yeah. No, it's awesome. It's, it's really like living in the moment with that. Uh, Jake says my favorite match would have to be Neil versus Devin Moore on Sean's show after night two when Marcus Crane pinned Neil. Then he and, and Deb dumped the bottle of liquor on Neil. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> uh, it's funny because Marcus did that and then he goes, oh, yeah, you're not you don't drink. I'm sorry. And I'll go, ah, you're not Moxley. I'll drink with you, Marcus. <laughs> I took a big swig and he's just so stunned. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like pouring alcohol on me though man like i hate alcohol i hate the smell of it oh okay okay uh (laughs) yeah the alcohol thing is just uh i just prefer not to okay okay that's cool that's cool uh so i we were gonna we were gonna introduce staple gun bob but since he's not here you also told me that you were gonna start naming your props to use in the ring so can we have some of the names of the others and is there also a weapon you wouldn't use uh well if i ever use spoons there if i ever have a spoon like prop and bring out with me like bob he will be named mark uh, from the room you know oh hi mark you know that whole thing. <laughs> uh if i ever bring skewers out to pay tribute to masada it'll, they will be known as skewer steves skewer steve <laughs> um and uh Hopefully, Pondo will give me permission to use a cinder block more often, and I will call that Cindy. <laughs> all right, cinder block Cindy, yeah. I love this. I love I love all the nicknames. So I love Staple Gun Bob. It just it's so great. <laughs> it's so different. All right, so we're gonna talk about I see Dub, one of my favorite promotions. Uh, so we're gonna talk about also one of my favorite matches that you got to work with Brandon Kirk and Casey Cattell. Well. Casey Kirk. Oh, Casey Tell. So let's let's talk about that. And it's shout out to Casey because I know Casey was like, you gotta get Neil on the podcast. So I love her, but she's a bitch. She oh. kicked me in the balls. <laughs> and planted me on my goddamn head. Fuck her. Fuck the Kirk. <laughs> forget to buy their merch. New shirt's cool. <laughs> 
I can't. It's always a great time over at ICW. And again, like, I feel like that is another, like, very insane, like, loyal crowd to get really into it. But. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, uh,. It, like it's so funny because like in wrestling you hear so many things about so many people and like I, i'm the type that give people the benefit of the doubt until they show me otherwise it's like from everything i've heard uh like people say about danny and struggles and all this and i'm just like guys they're from the east coast like give them a break fuck <laughs> like not all or sunshines and rainbows like fucking matt tremont like some of them are gritty man <laughs> some of them are cool you know it shit happens you know? Right, right. <laughs> There's a lot of, like, uh, upcoming talent, I feel like, that we've also been seeing in ICW and bringing other names that uh, you might not even be familiar with, which is, that's what I love about the indie scene. So, it's just... Yeah, I like the variety. Like, uh, it was funny, because uh, we didn't hear anything back from uh, Jeff King for WrestleMania weekend, so none of us knew if he was in the area or if he was even coming or anything like that. It just kind of ghosted us. Mm-hmm. We're assuming life happened, you know, no harm, no foul. Shit happened. Um, but, like, he walked up and he's like, hey, are you okay with working tank? And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, of course I will. Like, why wouldn't I? Like, the dude's a legend. Like, why wouldn't I want to work this cat? Right. Like, of course. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> and walks off. And then fucking all of a sudden I'm getting insane lane and fucking uh, I get Atticus the second time. And then he told me before I went out, he's like, if you can pull out a win, then you can call out Masada and we'll make it happen. I was like, OK. And that's why the whole match, like I'm grunting as if I'm in real pain because I'm really in pain, <laughs> in a lot of pain. <laughs> so, <laughs> just like, uh, facing Akira and the Kirks, like. Brandon, like, that dude is a tough motherfucker. Like, the dude is Steve Carino 2.0. Like, no no joke. The dude bleeds buckets, and all you got to do is flick him in the head with a gusset. And <laughs> dude's just bleeding profusely. <laughs> cracks me up. <laughs> Casey. Like, and, uh, it's so funny because, uh, you know, Casey Keto hasn't changed her last name yet for some weird fucking reason. Uh, you know, uh... Like, I made jokes at the beginning of the match about them, you know, being married and tell death do you apart. And, like, I want her to be in the ring. Like, no, dude, there's no point in you being outside the ring. You're going to get in eventually. Like, just stay in the ring. Let's make this a two-on-one. Why be cowards about it? But, no, she had to go outside and, you know, be a little brat. Damn. I feel that in my gut, man. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Man, what do you expect? <laughs> All right, so le- you also recently were king of death matches. It was such a cool concept, and uh, like we talk about, death matches becoming more and more of a thing, and it's interesting to see who's entered. So, can we talk about a little bit of your experience with this and like the new upcoming death match wrestlers that are coming? Well, uh. With my King of Death experience, like, the only thing that really sucked about that was my second round, I had two 440 members. Mm-hmm. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I look across the ring, and I just see two members on the same team, and I'm like, man, someone fucking here. Like, how did I get this draw? <laughs> like, did they pull it out of a hat? Like, really? Oh, man. So, like, I tried to fight as hard as I could, uh, and I got cut right above my temple with one of those uh, fucking mirrors. And, like, instantly starts spewing blood fucking everywhere. And I was like, oh, no, this is not good. <laughs> like, not good at all. And uh, I was finally getting up on him thinking, like, yeah, this is, I'm going to get at least one of them out and fuck one of these dudes. Like, that consolation prize, if I can't make it through it all the way, you know, I can at least eliminate one. And fucking got Eric Ryan down, thought I had him. Here comes fucking Kira, uh, not Kira, and Atticus and fucking skewers me. I was so pissed off. <laughs> like that's why you see me like react for a second and then I fucking grab cubes and just slam them down like you motherfucker like I was about to fucking do this thing <laughs> and it, he eliminates me and uh, yeah like the only consolation to that was the fact that I got Bob back because Atticus was dumb enough to bring him out with him so, <laughs> so yeah I was able to get Bob back secretly and like he was too worried about Ryan so I was like yes opportunity opportunity <laughs> now you gotta take that door <laughs> Mine, <laughs> pretty much. 
<laughs> yep. I think as I did it, I went yoink. Like a cartoon character. I love it. I love mine, mine, mine. <laughs> like the little birds. Uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark Leslie's in the chat. He goes, who is Neil's dream partner to face the Kirks? Ooh. I'm trying to think of someone who, who would be like super fun to be with. Mm hmm. And someone who who would absolutely just tear them apart. I think. <laughs> well, my dream tag team of, like partner would be Mastata. So there's the brutal. <laughs> Damn. The one to just be like super fun would be like Danny Damato. He has such a history with them. I'd be like, nah, Danny, like have fun. <laughs> I'd just stand back and like watch him for a second and be like, all right, I better help. <laughs> <laughs> Like, just, oh, that would just be fun. Like, me and Satu, I think we need to tag the team a little bit more whenever they do them because, like, me and him are just goofballs. Like, we could have fun together and be serious and be brutal. And I think uh, someone named us the Dream Warriors. Mm -hmm. So, I guess that's our name. I don't fucking know. <laughs> I love it. I feel like Paro would be fun with you, too, though. Like, yeah, but the guy got a shot before me. <laughs> I want a random... Number one contendership. This dude wins it next week. He gets a title shot. I'm like, what? What just happened? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, oh, so confused. But whatever. Saying, I, I think that'd be fun, but I, I feel like that'd be a lot of me getting chucked around because <laughs> he would just use me as a missile. You know, <laughs> I can see yeah, people. That's all that would end up being. <laughs> I feel like I felt so bad when Casey got thrown at no peace. And I was like, oh, my God. I felt that for her. Like, oof. I, I have no. No, she kicked me in the balls. Fuck her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's what she gets. <laughs> well, we're going to we're going to touch base on no peace because I love the concept of no ring death match. I, I love never by the fact that it's like no ring just in general like I, I see those matches you see like the regular matches in a no ring uh but then you're putting death match into a no ring uh, now we're starting to see like more companies that are doing this so can we talk some about your experiences and the difference of you know having no ring up against being in an actual ring with death with death matches oh uh, well like, uh, it's so funny because I hear people complain about not having a ring. Mm -hmm. And I look at them and I'm like, learn to work in no ring, dude. Like, they're not that hard. They're really not. <laughs> like, tell the same kind of stories with or without a ring. It doesn't matter. Uh, just the, how, do you, how do you adapt to the environment around you? Like, uh, a good example, like, when I went into uh, ICW... Uh, I researched all their, their shows leading up to it because about halfway through their beginning run of the pandemic, like I really didn't uh, pay attention. I was just working all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so I followed up on all their stuff and saw that they had chains and stuff roped. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's real cool. Like you, there are certain things that the ropes allow you to do that you can't do in this ring, obviously. Right. And uh, when I first showed up last October, I flat out told Danny and everyone, I'm like, Give me about a year. I'll tame these chains. Like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the only dude who can do it. And uh, to see guys like Great Scott be able to just hop on the road chain and just hop off, I was like, hell yeah. I'm starting to get a new wave of dudes because I know how to get this stuff good and, and looking nice. But, like, to me, no rings are no different than, than normal ring matches. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to be – I'm going to avoid falling on my back as often as possible because the ground is <laughs> 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 I just had a uh, Gigi Everson, one of uh, H2O's uh, students over there, uh, and he was talking about he just did a no ring death match with Jeff Cannonball. Um, and there was like a bunch of like hay and grass he was talking about. And he was like, he goes, I was full of all that stuff. And I was like, would you rather that or would you rather be in concrete, you know, no ring death match? So, <laughs> yeah, what would you rather fall on? Broken pieces of the door or the concrete? <laughs> like, either one are going to be good, but at least one will try to break your fall. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I know a bunch of them are still new to it. Yeah. No, that was yeah. great. Oh, man. Uh, Mark says, who's scarier, Masada or Sawyer Wreck? Masada, hands down. Masada is <laughs> the most intimidating person I've ever seen in my life. One of the most 
ter- terrifying people in the world. Mm-hmm. Like, he's just massive. Like, he could have killed me at any moment during our match. Any moment. So you're wrecked. You know, like, she was bringing it to me, but I could feel that she wasn't putting all of her weight behind her, you know, just lack of experience hits kind of thing. Like, she wasn't throwing all her weight into it. Mm-hmm. She would have. She probably would have knocked my ass out. But uh, I guess I have a, a steel jaw, I guess, because <laughs> I was able to take blows from Masada. <laughs> and like, so, you know, like, uh, definitely Masada. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So the list of people that you face the ring, obviously, is, like, endless. Like you said, Masada, uh, Mickey Knuckles, Marcus Crane, Rejects. I mean, it just can keep going on and on and on. But and now I know, like, the possibilities are, you know, again, like, it's just endless. But with the new, newer generation that's moving up, and it's crazy because, like, every day I feel like there's new people and it's hard to keep tabs on everybody since, like, I mean, I live in New York and it's like I keep tabs with, you know, only so much. But is there yeah. anybody in mind that comes to you that you would love to work? Uh, Tommy Vendetta right now, for some reason, strikes out to me. I think me and him would have a brutal, pretty brutal match. Um... Yeah, outside of him, like, I would probably say Arrow Boy. I've been wanting to be in a ring with him for a very long time, but he's been around for fucking ever. Uh, yeah, probably Vendetta, just because he kind of popped up against Dale. Mm-hmm. And I've always seen a, a few of his matches, primarily normal matches. So to see him hop into death matches and kind of be natural with it, right. it is pretty rare. Like, even Akira, like, his first match with Reed like I really didn't feel like you felt comfortable where Vendetta felt very comfortable in it right away you know so like he, he's the one dude I'd be like yeah I I can see myself being across the ring with him and something special happening okay. you know awesome awesome I love to like put over always like the new talent and it's like there's names that always get floated around that like maybe I'm not aware of or the fans are not aware of and it's always like a great way to put out more names out there so people can definitely look into um, yeah, Tommy Vendetta is a good hybrid wrestler. Like, he does it all. Uh, you like most death matches. Most of us are hybrids now. Like, we can do normal matches and tag matches and all that shit if no one looks for them. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. Um, so, I love asking this question. I love, I love to hear all the funny stories. So, give me your best road trip story. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I know there's a bunch. I, I should throw Sean under the bus, but I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> Okay. All right. I got one. So we're uh, heading to H2O for uh, uh, something or another. I can't remember what show it is. But uh, me, the hooligans, and uh, I can't remember uh, the other name, the other like guy I can say. I can't remember his name. But uh, there's two names I'm not going to mention just, just to keep them safe. Okay. You're good. Uh, but uh, we get pulled o- or we get a flat tire in the middle of like Ohio or some shit, and like we're just pulled over with flashes on, you know, smoking pot, just waiting to do our thing, you know, wait for a tire to get here, and fucking a cop pulls up. So I get out and I go to, you know, wave him down and make sure he he knows that everything's okay. He asks me to get back in the car. I'm like, okay. Runs the plates and all this, and I'm telling the guys in the car like, yeah, there's a cop behind us. So everyone's hiding whatever they got. <laughs> and fucking uh, walked over to Mason's window, and Mason can't roll down the window, so he opens the door to him and uh, asked me to get out and all this. And, you know, about 10 minutes later of us just talking, uh, explaining to him that I got a good record and, you know, there's nothing illegal in the car and all this jazz. And he look, uh, takes my license and only runs mine. And I guess because I was so respectful and, like, polite to him and stuff like that, I'm usually a pretty polite guy. Um, but uh, he went back and ran my record. I put my hands in my jacket, and I realized I got a grinder and a baddie and a lighter in my pocket. Oh, no. <laughs> and I get frisked. I'm fucked. So uh, I'm just standing there, and I'm just la, 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 minding my own thing, not making any eye contact. Eventually, I can see out of the corner of my eye, the cop's head dips just a little bit. And he, like In that moment, I knew I got away with it. I knew I was clear. But I had a perfect record at the time. <laughs> so he waves me over to the car and I lean over and he's like, here's your license. 
get that tire fixed. Be careful. If you guys are smoking any pot or anything like that, like get somewhere safe. Please don't do it. And I'm like, there's nothing like that in the, in the car, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hope you have a good, safe day. And I go walking and as I'm walking up to the van. I just got a biggest shitty grin on my face. <laughs> Get in the car, cop pulls off, and they're like, What did you say to him, Neil? I was like, Nothing, I was just nice. <laughs> I got a clean record, fuckers. What are you talking about? Pull out the bat, he light it right in front of them. They're like, Oh my god, you are fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my Man, god. Okay, don't give a fuck. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> since we're talking road trip, favorite road trip snack? Uh. Ugh. Usually I get Cheez-Its mm-hmm. or chips of some sort. Usually something small I can kind of tuck away. I'm like a squirrel. <laughs> like I'll eat a little bit and I'll tuck the food away and then later on I'll grab it and start eating it again. <laughs> like, where'd you get that? I was like, I tucked it away in this pocket right here. <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm like, hungry later. <laughs> you could be like my friend Brad that you just like save it in your beard and pull it out later. <laughs> oh, that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it would be compared to an animal, but that no, that's redneckish. Ah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my god, I can't. All right, I gotta ask you my infamous question that I ask everybody: What's the craziest thing a fan's done to get your attention? Uh, huh. You talking about like during a match or like just me it, walking? It could out? be yeah, like during a match, like you're at a show. Whether you're walking around, whether you're in the match, or after you're leaving the match, like has there been any funny stories that have happened? <laughs> if you watch any of my matches, just because <laughs> like they pump the audio in for the commentators louder than the actual sound in the building, mm-hmm. like if you ever hear me say something like, um, like. You hear me sing like the end of a song or something. It's because I heard someone say the first part of it, or like um, I'll be in some type of battle royal where the only way to be eliminated is like a pinfall or something. I'll like fall out to the ring and I'll just start making jokes about how like, God damn, they hit fucking hard, and just make jokes about <laughs> what's going on in the situation. Like uh, Dale Patrick's when we first faced in the pit, he hit me with the record and broke it. I went, Oh, that's not the hit I like. You know, like you make stupid cracks like that. Usually, I, I try to interact with with people as often as I can. If I can hear, if I hear something weird, I'll, I'll definitely respond to it. I think during Dale's match, um, somebody said "gush, gush, uh, uh, goodness gracious," and as I'm throwing something in the ring, I go "great balls of fire." <laughs> you know, it's just random things I'll say. You know, if the. The more 80s or 90s references you make, the more likely I'm going to respond to you. Like, uh, when I uh, put up a gusset plate when I was facing Atticus the first time, I put up a gusset plate. I was like, you want to see me destroy something pretty or something beautiful? And that's a quote from uh, Fight Club. Yeah. You know? Or Yippie Kaye. Like, I'll just say random movie quotes, too. So, you just got to say something weird around me, and I'll probably get it and be like, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> now people are gonna watch the, they're gonna watch this interview and now they're gonna like come up to you and say like random stuff now <laughs> i hope they do it during the match like that's funny to me like uh when i worked at party hard i faced some kid named maverick maverick something and like i grabbed the mic and i was like hey man i got one question where's goose like shouldn't he be here and like i could hear smatters of like laughter from older people in the crowd but all the kids are like what <laughs> And I was like, never mind, Top Gun, 1980-something movie, Tom Cruise, and just threw the mic and just ran at the kid. <laughs> like, sometimes it hits, sometimes it don't, you know. It just, you know, uh, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, let me give some love to my chat over here. A card story says, have you been asked to work in GCW? No. I have not gotten an offer to, to GCW. If they if they send me an invitation, I will gladly accept it. It doesn't interfere with any of my other dates, and be more than happy to come out. I am not. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this because I don't want to get misinterpreted. Uh, I am not restrained by any means uh, by ECW or uh, ICW. Like I am loyal to them. I will always do their shows. But if 
GCW wanted to book me, they're not going to be against it. Awesome. Awesome. No, that's how it should be. Definitely. I mean, there's so many wonderful promotions out there and it's nice to see even like the fans that maybe aren't in a particular state that maybe that they'll see in another state, which is, which is great. Yeah, too. You never know. I just uh, wrestled in North Carolina for the first time, like randomly, <laughs> you know, so I wrestled in Arkansas, I think earlier in this year, never been there before. Um, trying to think i want to say north dakota was one of them too that i never did before so like i'm definitely starting to cover the states yeah. just gonna keep on those licenses ones those are the ones i can't get to <laughs> so i'm not gonna go out of my way to get the licenses so is there like anywhere you would like to travel like besides like state wise and you said like you're crossing off like states of where you would like to book at but like would you like to go somewhere like mexico or japan or <laughs> just the way you can see my face that's kind of a <laughs> dumb question like i, I not um, but just uh like of course like i want to go to go to mexico canada uk australia japan like japan is the end goal mm-hmm. that is the end game for me like if i can get there and and get to wrestle a certain person out there or one of three people I, I will be very happy and very fulfilled in my career right now, just because Masada was marked off. Mm-hmm. Got to set that next goal and hopefully getting out of the country will, will happen before either the end of this year or by the beginning of next year. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Uh, more love in the chat for you. Rubber toe says, Hey Neil, thanks for the cool convo and the awesome match with Corey Bryan at unholy War- uh, warfare. Oh, uh, no problem. <laughs> that little bastard kept running at me. Chip <laughs> eventually slowed down. <laughs> um, Eric Williams says, "What's Neil's dream match?" Uh, Masada was uh, saying, uh, it, "Like it, it's not. I don't really have dream matches because, like, mm-hmm. I get surprised with them all the time. Like Insane Lane, Tank." Uh, I'm getting Pondo here. You know, I've known Pondo for decade for over a decade. Mm-hmm. Like, never thought I'd get to work him. Now I get to work him. Um, uh, like, fun matches, I think, that would be really fun to do would be, like, Arrow Boy, uh, Sexy Eddie would be real fun. Uh, Nate Webb, just on entrances alone. Um, uh, like, right now, like, the, the top of the list, the top three names I would like to work before my career is over, I guess you could call them dream matches, would be Jukasai, uh, Takeda, and I always say his name wrong, and for some reason I don't know why, but Takeda. Takeda, yeah. Uh, the blue-haired dude yeah, that yeah, gets yeah. spiked in his mouth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like those are my three top dudes that I would really like to work before, before it's all said and done. Uh Joel Bateman, I'd like to get in the ring with. Uh, uh, Callen, I uh, I can't remember his last name. It, it's Callen uh, the Butcher, I think. Mm-hmm. He's an Australian cat down there. Guido's down there. Uh, big fucking Joe in the UK. Come over there and show him what some real fucking anarchy's like. Uh, plus, I want to do a promo against him because he's so such a polite man. Like, the, just the way his voice sounds, like the promo would be hilarious because he'd be like, "I'm gonna hurt you, mate." <laughs> but it's gonna be okay. Like he just sounds like a dude that that wants to hurt you, or he's trying to be tough, but really deep down inside, it sounds like he's just a wholesome person. Yeah, <laughs> you know, probably just the British accent. You know, oh. Uh, oh. yeah, like that. That's kind of my list right now, I guess. If you if you want to call it a list. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The the possibilities are always endless. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like the MCU multiverse. Like, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> the great Harry Barton says, How much fun was beating up Chando at H2O last year? Big fan of any time someone beats up the guy I adopted as my podcast host, podcast co host. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a lot of uh, fun in that match because, like, it's only the second, like, barefoot match I've ever done. And the first one was against Freak Show at a carnage cup eight and that's when i got introduced to staple gun Mm -hmm. so uh you can blame freak show for that (laughs) uh, just the fact that it was a celebration of danny havoc's life and career as a deathmatch guy and just all around good dude and 
the fact that I we got to do it on Halloween, I got to dress up as Adam Bueller, who's a real good friend of mine and just someone I wanted to pay tribute to. So I hit two kind of three birds with one stone. I got to pay tribute to Danny, who was a huge influence on my career. I got to pay tribute to Adam Bueller, who's a great friend of mine. And I got to do a barefoot match, which I know Adam would be laughing at how stupid I am for. <laughs> so to be able to all do that and afterwards look at Chondo in the face and you kind of see my motion. Like I kind of raised, like shrug at him. And in that moment, I just looked at him. The whole vibe I was trying to give him was told you, told you you could do this. Mm -hmm. I can do a good match. It's just a matter of how good it was, you know? And when people come up and they're like, that's probably Chondo's best match he's ever had. Yeah. Fills me with a lot of pride because I really didn't do much. I was mainly Chondo doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that match. So that's, Heads off to Chondo. Like, the dude deserves a lot more respect than he gets. Chondo's great people. Like, love him over there. Good, good people. Um, so, I have two final questions. Uh, if you guys have anything else, drop it in chat and I'll, I'll pull it. Um, so, what would you like your legacy to be? Uh, just that I was a good, fair dude. You know, I don't want anyone to, like, hate me. <laughs> like, obviously, I'm going to have detractors and haters and all that. But, like, at the end of the day, um, I always thought of myself as, like, a carpenter of death. Like, I just was able to build stuff out of nothing and pull things out of my brain that other people haven't seen or haven't thought of yet. And um, just that I tried to help everyone I could along the way, really. Just I try to be as respectful as I can to everyone I can. You know, if anyone's got a problem with me, I try to work it out with them because... There's no, there's life's too short to, yeah. to be mad at someone over something that could be as petty as just someone blindly saying something because they were not thinking about it, you know? Right. Uh, so I, I just want to be kind of known as a good dude that just wanted to live out his dream and get as far as he possibly could. Mm -hmm. You know, my ultimate goal is to be considered one of the best in the world at death matches. Right now, I believe I'm one of the best in the States, and I'll put that up against any any of the best in the States. If John wants to test that theory, let's test that theory. Cologne, let's test that theory. Atticus, let's test that theory. Like, Nick Gage, dude, I, I don't care. If anyone wants to claim they're the best in the world, like, I will test that theory. Because I think I am one of the best in the world. So, I love that. Like, definitely, yeah. definitely love that. Mark says you're the best, man. Uh, Roberto says, have you worked Raven Havoc before? If not, would you like to? And my first time seeing him was at the show for Cult the other day. Yes, I have worked him at a place called Total Psychopathic Wrestling uh, in Tennessee. Um, the weapon selection wasn't the greatest, but I would like to work him again just because he was fun to be in a ring and everything that we got to do with the limitations that we had were fun. So, like, yeah, definitely. I would like to. I'd like to work him on a bigger stage, where he could be seen a little bit better and noticed by by the right kind of people that would benefit from him being on their show. So, definitely, I would like to work him again. Awesome, awesome. So, I like to end my interviews off uh, with this this question for all uh, our amateur and uh, inspiring wrestlers that are out there. But I'd love for you to give like a piece of advice. Uh, to anybody that's looking to come into the business or train, or starting to train. Okay, I will give you the same advice I gave the hooligans when they asked me that, and that's find a school that has good credentials, a school that's going to train you properly in what you need to do inside and outside the ring, you know, a complete business training aspect of it. Um, you know, like, if you want to go to Japan, find a company that primarily works in Japan that works here in the States has a good connection to them. You know, um, uh, I, I believe WWA four is still running in Georgia. I know, uh, Matt Tremont has his H2O. Like that's a great place that to me, that's the best place to go in the Indies because he trains them all correctly. Like it, if anyone tells me that they're trained by Matt Tremont, they instantly are certified by me. Like I will trust them to do whatever the fuck they want to do to me. Because that's how good the training is. Uh, but definitely find a school that's, that's with good credentials. And if that means you have to move, 
I mean, you have to move. You know, sacrifice is part of living your dream. So, yeah, find a good good school with good credentials, and it will lead you hopefully on the right path of where you want to go. Definitely great advice. I love it. Um, obviously, a lot of people know I'm here. I work a lot with H2O. You guys see it. These kids are incredible over there. It's so great, the training and everything. So, um, again, there's a million freaking schools out there that have great credentials. So, love it. Oh, oh, another another new dude. Well, he's kind of not a new dude no more, but bam. <laughs> bam Sullivan. <laughs> oh, he's that bald fuck. <laughs> Looks like a giant goose egg. <laughs> I, I love Bam Sullivan. He's so great. Uh, we just had an interview with him recently as well. So, guys, if you haven't checked out that interview, go back on the old part or go check out that interview that we had with him. So, uh, I saw him at, uh, I saw him at uh, Raven's show, uh, All for Colt. And it was funny because he started talking. I was like, man, you Boston people crack me up. And he's like, I'm from this place. And I'm like, it all sounds the fucking same to me, bro. <laughs> I say area, y'all blumble your words together anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and he can laugh. About it. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. So you are a busy man. You have a lot coming up. So I have all the thumbnails for you guys on the screen. If you guys are watching the audio, definitely follow Neil on social. But you are busy. <laughs> you are very. Very busy with a lot of upcoming shows. You got ICW, you got No Peace, you got I ICW, uh, it's Wisconsin, right? And RPW yeah. coming up like, wow. Be yeah, uh, this Friday is RPW up in uh, Michigan, Erie, Michigan. Uh, Sunday is the Insane 8 for ICW Milwaukee. Uh, what's the next month after that? Uh, September 11th, I got No Peace. Yeah. And then October 2nd, or 1st and 2nd, I've got ICW with the Pondo and Eddie only. And then that night or the next morning, i got to fly to California so I can face Sage Sin in the uh, Pumpkin Patch death match at Crimson Crown in California. <laughs> that sounds fun. Oh, I yeah. love that. I love Most that. Lake Death will be on uh, September 18th. Uh, I think I'm on that. I would have to double check. I am not 100 on that. I think I just spoiled something possibly. <laughs> so. It's okay. And keep it, keep it busy. So with that being said, tell everybody where they can find you on social so they can follow all your matches and things that are coming up as well and come bother you and buy some merch as well. Um, you can get all my t-shirts at deathmatchworldwide.com. Corey's a cool cat. Uh, you should have your shirts within two weeks. He's real good about that. Uh, high quality shirts. Uh, I make the same amount from that website as I would live. So profit margin doesn't matter. I'm still getting the same amount of money. Uh, it helps me out with shipping and like sometimes I'm not able to get my own shirt. So that's probably the easiest way to get a shirt. Uh, on Instagram, I'm NDCPOD, uh, which just got reactivated. Apparently I put up a bullying comment, which I don't remember putting up and they never showed me. So <laughs> who knows if that's true or not, but whatever. <laughs> Um, and on Twitter, I'm Fearless Neil. Uh, and that, that's it for now as far as social media is. Awesome. Such. All those links are in the description below. Go buy some merch. Go support Neil. Go bother him when he comes out after his uh, entrance and <laughs> yell some funny things at him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if anyone says happy, happy, joy, joy, I'm probably going to do the dance that Ren <laughs> Stimpy. <laughs> It's so great. Uh, maybe I'll bring a uh, uh, like frog uh, chew toy for a dog, and I'll bring a baseball bat. <laughs> Do a beast of butthead reference. <laughs> See if can get this. There you go. There you go. Well, Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. It was lovely chatting with you. So, and thanks everybody in the yeah. chat. <laughs> I'll just. It's been a fun chat. So again, thank you guys so much. Stay safe, support independent wrestling, and we will talk to you guys soon. Have a good night.